Hey, robot makers, hope you have had a good day so far. So do you want to make, or do you want to know how to make your own captive portal access point using a Raspberry Pi Pico W and MicroPython? Want to control your own robots using Wi-Fi without the need for an existing Wi-Fi network? So imagine doing this in the middle of nowhere or some kind of event, then this is the show for you. So let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin, come with me so we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Okay, let's get right to this. So I've mysteriously called this show the Wi-Fi in the Woods, and we can talk about that uh, a little bit later on. Um, I've also subtitled this, or How to Build a Captive Portal with MicroPython and Few. Now, we looked at Few last week, um, so we'll do a bit of a recap over what we covered and what we didn't cover. So um, that's the first thing I'm going to cover off. Uh, this show is all about how to build this access point and captive portal. If you don't know what that means, we'll certainly explain that in the show today. If you don't know what that means, you're probably wanting to know how to do it, and it's ridiculously simple. Um, so we're going to look at what a captive portal is, why you would want to use one. We're going to look at DNS as well because although this is like quite a simple thing to type in MicroPython, there's quite a lot of knowledge required behind the scenes. So we'll very briefly touch on that just to sort of explain the behind the scenes, how it works stuff. And then, um, yes, we'll have a look at how, how the whole things work. We'll also have another little bit of theory, which is about the OSI model. It's interesting, I promise. Um, and this this has probably got lots of bits and pieces in there that you might think, ah, I always wonder what that stood for. This is why, and this is how it all fits together. So it's a little bit of theory there. And if you're watching this live, you can have a bit of a Q&A with me after the uh, the main show is over. So stick around for that. And if you're watching that on replay, then you're missing out. You want to catch me on 7 o'clock um, UK local time, so usually GMT, GMT plus one, depending if it's uh, summertime or not, um, and then uh, join the chat. Okay, so let's get over to uh, the first bit, shall we? So yes, last week we looked at Few, which is the new um, Pico or Python HTTP endpoint wrangler um, that um, Pimroni created for the Enviro range of products. It's absolutely an amazing, tiny, really efficient uh, MicroPython library. And um, it's a very simple yet powerful web framework for building interactive websites on a Pico W in MicroPython. That's right, we're building websites on a microcontroller. This is just absolutely nuts, but you can do it and it's absolutely uh, absolutely doable, easy to do, fun. So last week we looked at how to do logging, how to do how to use the templating system. We looked at how to use the web server to uh, uh, serve out files and so on. We did look at forms and it didn't work last week, but it works this week and I'm going to show you exactly how it works. So yes, uh, Pimroni built this almost as like a, just a by the way thing as part of their Enviro Grow, Enviro Weather, Enviro Indoor, Enviro Urban range of products. So it's built into that as part of the provisioning software. So we didn't touch on access portals. We are going to look at that this week. So what is an access uh, an access point or a captive portal? Well, the access point is when you connect to Wi-Fi, you're connecting to an access point. So you're kind of in the guest mode and the access point is kind of in the host or server mode. So it's a different way of um, connecting. So uh, one has to be the sort of primary, one's the secondary, if you like. Now, a captive portal uh, runs on, a, on an access point. And the description here, I think really sums it up. It says a captive portal is a web page accessed by a web browser that is displayed to newly connected users of that Wi-Fi or wired network. It doesn't have to just be Wi-Fi um, before they are granted broader access to network resources. Well, how about we never grant people access to those broader network resources? We just do everything in the captive portal because it's a really cool and neat way of uh, interacting with users. That's what we're going to look at today. So why would we want to do this? What is this for? So if you think normally, if you've got a robot and you're, you're connecting um, to your Raspberry Pi Pico W or other MicroPython device, ESP32, whatever, if you're connecting to them over Wi-Fi, you have to have an existing Wi-Fi infrastructure to connect that to. So that thing will look for your SSID, it'll provide the password, and it'll connect to the already established Wi-Fi network. That's all well and good if you're you know, at home, in the office, wherever, at work. But if you're in the middle of nowhere, say you're in the woods, say you're uh, in the middle of like a trade show or you're in an event in a library, I don't know, somewhere where you're not on your home network, how do you connect to your Wi-Fi device? Um, or how does your Wi-Fi device connect to say your phone or your tablet so that you can control it? So you need an access point. This means that we can connect anywhere if we have an access point. We can connect to another device, phone, tablet, like I said, Pico W, anywhere, wherever we want, battery powered. 
So think remote control robot outside of Wi-Fi. So what I have in mind for this, uh, you might have seen just at the very beginning of the show that if I go to my, uh, I think it's this camera, you can see I've got this little blue thing here that's got a Pico on it among some other bits and pieces. It also has a plasma 2040 and that's uh, currently just flashing this LED strip. So what I have in mind for this long term is I want to make a raincoat for my dog that I can control over Wi-Fi from my phone so I can type in some text and have it scroll using a matrix of uh, RGB LEDs, make it display colors, all that kind of stuff. But I want to be able to control it for my phone while I'm walking my dog, while I'm not near my home network, not, not within range of that. So how can I do that? This is perfect for that. So this is kind of what I've got in mind. So it's really fun that the possibilities when you start thinking about it are literally endless. You can be on a bus and just pop up a little Wi-Fi uh, hotspot and if people are looking through, it might pop up there and they might think, hmm, what's this? If it has like, don't connect to this Wi-Fi, they might think, oh, I'll just try and connect to that and see what happens. Uh, and then the captive portal can pop up and you can give them some, uh, you know, some surprise message or <laughs> whatever you like. So yes, this is what I have in mind, cyber dogs. There's my little doggy Archie. Uh, he's very kindly modelling the uh, the little saddle that I've made for him. Um, so this doesn't need to connect to uh, any other network. It will provide the uh, the Wi-Fi hotspot, and we can then control that plasma for 2040 using the Raspberry Pi Pico W. And we can do that using that code that I created a couple of weeks ago. I think was it two weeks ago, where we had the Pico to Pico communication using UART. That's exactly how the two devices are going to communicate because the um, the Plasma 2040 doesn't have Wi-Fi connectivity yet. So note, this doesn't connect to the internet or any other network. So currently, I think the Wi-Fi access point can only support one connection. I'm not sure if there's any more than that, but I think it, it's a microcontroller. It's got really limited memory. Uh, there's, a, there's a limit to what it can do. So I think out the box, it can only do one connection. Happy to be proved wrong with that, but I'm pretty sure that that's the case. Uh, and yeah, you don't get kind of free Wi-Fi with this. It isn't connected to anything else, so it hasn't got any other internet to connect to. And I'm sure the question will come up, can we um, make this like a router or a bridge? So if there's another Wi-Fi network, it can kind of prolong, you know, extend the use of that by rebroadcasting out. The honest answer is I don't know. It sounds like something you could do, but I don't know whether the mode switching can happen really quickly or not. Bet somebody can come up with a, a way of doing this, probably in C, not sure about MicroPython. So we shall see on that one, <laughs> pun intended. Right, so, before we get into how we do the uh, the captive portal stuff, we just need a little bit of background knowledge about DNS. So what is DNS? So DNS stands for Domain Name Service. And we're going to have a lot of acronyms today, so you might want to pencil some of these down. <laughs> I've tried to remember and call them out where I can. Um, so let's start off with uh, the first thing that happens. So each of these little devices on the bottom there are on a local area network. It could be Wi-Fi, wired, it doesn't really matter in this case. They all have an internet protocol address, an IP address. And that's a unique number uh, on that particular network. And each computer has to know the address of the other computers that it wants to speak to. So if I'm on... 192.168.0.1 and I want to communicate to the other computer there, the blue one, I have to know in advance that that's 192.168.0.2. If I don't know that, I have no way of knowing what its IP could be. And there is, what, 16 million IP addresses potentially of all the different combinations of, uh, of those four uh, bytes that could represent a number. Now, there are certain IP addresses that are considered like private and some of them that are public so that kind of slices that number in half um, and some of them are reserved for special things like um, like DNS servers for example. So that's the first thing each computer needs to know the IP address of other computers it wants to talk to without that prior knowledge it can't communicate to them it would have to guess and you'd be there a very long time and you would have no way of knowing if that's the right one or not. So if we have a web server out on the internet that means that it's limited. How do we know what that web server's IP address is? Now, back in the day, before we had things like DNS, you did indeed have to know what the IP address was of that server. Without that, you wouldn't be able to communicate to it. And even worse than that is that, that kind of locks people in. So if, say you're a big university and you've got this web server that's got all your publications on it and you want to do some maintenance on that, you might take that one down and bring another server up. But they can't have the same IP address. So you'd have to 
maybe change the IP address on one server to make it the original one so that all the people that are trying to communicate to it get the right one. And just consider at the moment that we're not talking about any kind of um, bridges or routing or proxies or, all, or load balancers or anything like that. We're just talking about machine to machine at this point. Um, and when we think about the internet, we don't think about IP addresses. If you go to like kevsrobots.com, you don't have to know what the IP address of kevsrobot.com is because we have this really friendly domain name which is the kevsrobot.com. Now, we're not going to talk about all the different subdomains today. There's lots of different ways that we can uh, slice up that domain name. I just really want to talk about the domain name itself and how it maps to IP addresses. So, like it says up there, this limits us to how we how to what we know about the computers in advance. Um, and if it's replaced, what happens if another one um, if it gets a new IP address, because maybe they, the university that it, you're trying to connect to has just changed all its IP addresses, you'd have to wait till the mail comes out, or the, uh, you know, there's a notice board, or there's this physical snail mail comes around saying, "Yet yeah, we've changed our IP address." That really wouldn't be very workable. So this is why this domain naming system came about. It's a much friendlier and hierarchical system. Um, so. There's, a, there's another um, acronym there, another TLA, another three letter acronym, which is URL. So you might hear about URLs and that's, we type the URL of the domain name into our browser when we're looking uh, for some information on the internet. So if you wanna Google something, you type in the name of the, uh, the thing that you're, you're connecting to and that's the uniform resource locator. So how do we connect to that web server? You know, we're sat here on our little co computer and we want to be able to connect to Kev's robot. How does our computer know which computer out there, how, you know, what the IP address is? Because at the end of the day, that's how commu computers communicate. So to solve this problem, we have a DNS server. So this is a domain name server. So we need to know um, what this is in advance. We need to know what our DNS server is in advance. And that's usually provided to us by our internet service provider, our ISP. Um, so when you type in, there's usually about three different bits of information that you need to type in when you're connecting to the internet. You need to know um, some kind of uh, gateway server, which is the thing that's gonna to talk to the, the ISP. Um, it's gonna to talk to the uh, domain name server. You might need to know some name servers. And again, the name servers are the DNS servers. That's exactly what they are for. And you might need to know some things like what your IP address is and your subnet mask and all that. We're not gonna look at that today. We're just gonna look at these simple things. So that information is provided to us we have to know what that dns server name is in advance there is lots of them out there some people so for example i'm on uh, british telecom for my um, my broadband my internet provision and their dns servers are not great so i don't use them i use like google's and i think google's are really easy to remember because it's like 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8. it's like 48 or 8.8.4.4 or 4.4.4.4 it's got some really simple ones to remember so you can plop them in um, and then you go direct to google to get your results and it should be more reliable so i think bt1 sometimes they're not as reliable for whatever reason right so we've got that dns server so if i want to connect to kevsrobots.com i basically go to that server and i say what is the ip address for kevsrobots.com and it will look in its little database it has a database full of dns records and if in there it has kesrobots.com and an IP address 192.168.10.254 in this case, then I now know what the IP address is and it sent that back to me. And that means I can now um, connect to that server directly and do whatever I need to do, grab the files, read the pages and so on. And there's a whole web of d domain name servers because they don't have an IP address for every other, you know, the other 16 million servers on the internet. That's where that hierarchy thing comes in. So they'll have a cache of ones that they know that are common. And uh, if there is one that they don't know, they will also have a DNS server that they connect to. And there are some very high level root domain name servers out there on the internet. They're, uh, they're sort of protected, they're special. And, um, they host that when you buy, when you buy a domain name that's what you're registering against these uh, these very top level domains so that's kind of how things work in the background this is significant later on with our captive portal this is why i bring this up so our captive portal how does this work so we have our captive portal and our our mobile phone in this case um, and our captive portal is an access point it's going to be sending out uh you know this is broadcasting out its ssid saying this is you know the wi-fi in the woods ssid um i broadcast that out my phone can see that and therefore it can connect to this access point the access point user gives it an ip address of its own as well like a 
DHCP, Dynamic Host Control Protocol, which is just like a temporary IP address. Um, it has a domain name server of its own because the access point needs to be able to route traffic coming from that wireless device. So from our phone, if our phone saying, take me to Kev's, kevsrobots.com, it needs to be able to look that up itself. So our captive portal has one of those and what it does, it's really sneaky. It basically just ignores what you've asked for and gives you a different page back, the same page that it, it's gonna host for any address that you send it. And that's how, it, how it's captive. It's captivating your attention by not <laughs> listening to anything that you're doing. It also has a router built in. So um, what it can do, it can route various different pages that it might have on, its, uh, on the, the PCORW and then send those pages back through the access point to your phone. So it can do some redirecting and routing of its own. And it's got a web server, so it can serve the pages that it, that it has for you so that you can browse them on your phone as well. So that's what a captive portal has. There are all the different parts that make it up. It's an access point, has a DNS server. It can do some routing behind the scenes and it has a web server to serve up the pages as well. And it will present those pages back to your device, like I said. Okay, now I said we would talk about the OSI model. Now this is something back from uh, computer science days when I used to do, a, when I did my degree in computer science and it's still relevant to today. You'll see all the different bits and pieces on here that make up all the network stuff that you do. So if we start at the very bottom uh, and work our way up, it'll make sense. And it's uh, there's a few acronyms out there, some naughty ones, some <laughs> normal ones um, to help you remember all the different uh, letters of the OSI stack. It's quite a useful thing to remember. Uh, if you work in IT anyway. So the very bottom level is the physical level. So whether we're working on Ethernet cables or Ethernet, however you want to pronounce it, um, whether you're working on radio, so 2.4 or 5 uh, gigahertz, um, or whether it's token ring back in the day, thin wire, there's lots of different physical mediums that we can transmit over, even like um, flashing lights you could have uh, as a medium. So whatever that, that, that agreement is of the, the devices that are going to communicate to each other because um, in intercommunication, it's usually between two devices. So we need some kind of transmission and reception medium of raw bit streams between them. We don't care anything about the actual content of that. We simply just want to be able to send and receive stuff. So Morse code works for that as well, for example. Um, that's probably f further up actually Morse code. That's probably in this sort of presentation layer. Anyway, so transmission of data frames between two nodes of um, that are connected by a physical layer. So the next one up, the data layer, that's where you see things like media access control. So imagine we have, um, like back in the day when I used to work in education, we had um, thin wire and we would have these little BNC connectors, little British network uh, connection. British Naval Connection, I think they stand for, BNC. It's uh, the kind of connection you used to have back on, um, I think my uh, uh, oscilloscope has these on it as well, actually. They're like a, a cylinder with like two little lugs on it and you can sort of screw the thing into place. And you would have many devices, like maybe up to 30 devices connected to the same piece of copper wire. Um, so what happens if all the devices communicate at the same time? You're just going to get laws of garbage, laws of noise, interfering signals and so on. So how do you make sure the whole thing works? The media is accessed and controlled in a particular way. And that's where these data layers come in, these media access control layers. And you might have heard of Mac before. You might have a Mac address on your network cards. Um, if you look on your mobile phone, it'll probably mention what its Mac address is. Uh, and these are unique IDs. But each device has a completely unique ID because when it's talking from one to another, they need to be able to address each other. A bit like the IP address thing we had. That's actually on the next layer. But Mac addresses are more lower level than that. Um, so you might have heard of 802.11, 802.11, ABG, or right up to, uh, what were we on now, AC, N was quite a, a new one a long time ago, uh, but all those different Wi-Fi standards. And there's also 802.15.4, which is Zigbee, and that's how our LED light bulbs, so I've got some Philips Hue light bulbs in this uh, studio, and they can connect to each other in a mesh network, and when you switch a light switch, it can send that, that signal all the way across its, its mesh network to the very end device, uh, and that's called Zigbee. Uh, there's, there's quite a few other different... Um, wireless protocols for light bulbs, but that's one of the most common ones for home automation. So the next layer above that is more around structuring things. So we've got structured multi-node network, including addressing, routing, and traffic control. So back in the day, we used to use like Novell Netware. 
um, networks and they had, um, goodness, what was it called? N NS something. I, I thought I'd be able to remember this off the top of my head, but I can't now. Um, but yeah, they, they had a different standard that wasn't TCP IP. So you'll see on this level, internet protocol comes about and internet protocol is what we use to communicate all our devices. We're very familiar with this. And when we're working with uh, our captive portals, we need to know about IP because we have an IP address of our, our access point and our the host that's going to connect to us will also have an IP address. You'll also hear about things like ARP and ARP table or ARP requests. And this is about address routing protocol. So we have network switches and network routers on the internet. The, the internet was designed by... Um, was it the defense um, ARPANET back in the day? The um, military used it. And the idea would be if there was like a nuclear attack in one place, it wouldn't take down all their communications. It could intelligently reroute based on uh, available routes. So you could have multiple routes, a primary route, a backup route, and it would carefully uh, negotiate that. Uh, and also maybe for efficiency and for, for balancing, load balancing. So all that kind of routing stuff goes on um, at this level, the network level. So the next layer above that is the transport layer. So this is where we have things like the, the actual packets that are sent by IP start to take shape. So we have uh, TCP or UDP. So a TCP is Transmission Control Protocol. And this is about if we send um, a packet of information, I want to make sure you've got that. And if I've got several packets of information, say I've got like a Word document and I want to send it to you, it might be huge. So what we have to do is slice up into little packets and each packet has got a piece of the whole word um, document and it's a bit like a jigsaw each packet gets like a unique number so it might be sequential one two three four five and when you receive them depending on the route that they've taken to get to you they might have be actually in the wrong order so it has to be reconstructed into the correct sequence before you can actually view the document so that's tcp transmission control protocol and we have things in there like we have acknowledgements so um, if i want to talk to you um, the first thing that I would do is I would sort of say um, hello and you would say hello back and that's me sending, sending you a message and you acknowledging back that you've got my message. Uh, this is also a, a little bit like um, like special delivery mail. So if I want to send you a message and know that you got it, I can send that message and I can pay a little bit extra and they'll record that I've sent it and then they'll record that it's got, it's got to its location and that you've received it and you've signed it to say that you've received it and I get that message back to say, yep, the person's got the message. All that takes actually quite a bit of backwards and forwards and that's what TCP does. Now, sometimes we haven't got time for that. So if we've got like a, say like the NASA launch and we've got a live stream, like I'm live streaming to you now, we've not got time to check that you've received every single packet. And in fact, if we drop a few packets here and there, it's not the end of the world. We just need to carry on. So these are a little bit more like postcards. So I don't really care if you get it or not, but I've sent it with the intention of you receiving it. It doesn't really matter. You might actually receive more than one. If I've sent the message a couple of times, it doesn't really matter. So UDP is... Um, now, I got this wrong last week and somebody bashed me over the head with this. I thought it was um, unsigned data pack, uh, datagram packet, but um, let me just check what that actually is. Um, so what does it stand for? UDP. So I should have had this before, should now up on the screen. User datagram packet. I thought it was like something to do with unsigned user data, user, user datagram protocol. And the idea is it's just a throwaway. It doesn't matter. And the idea is quicker. So real time streaming, audio streaming, things like that use UDP. So that's what that's for. The next level above this is about session. So this is where our DNS server comes in, in fact. So continuous exchange of information in form of multiple backwards and forward transmissions between two nodes. Um, so the session I always think is like if you connect your Raspberry Pi with SSH, you've got a session going on. There's a backwards and forwards. You're maintaining that connection um, for a certain amount of time. Um, the next level above that is character encoding. So data encryption, data compression, de uh, decryption, all that kind of good stuff. So on here, we have standards such as ASCII, which is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. So that was that whole 8-bit character where you can have 255, 256 characters. Um, so I remember capital A was 65 off the top of my head. So if you wanted to write a message and send it to somebody, you could do that in binary. 
you just have to know which bits to flip and you could send that message as ASCII. Now, the problem with ASCII is there are more, some languages have more than, um, more characters than were represented in the American standard code. So um, we needed to expand that so that it would include other language characters. So for example, Chinese, um, a lot of the, um, what they call Cyrillic languages, Cyrillic, they have different characters that were represented in ASCII. So we needed to expand the number of characters that we could represent in, in our range of characters. And what they essentially did was double the number of bytes that we used. Instead of one byte, it was two bytes and it was called Unicode. So we can have um, a lot more characters in Unicode than we had originally. So this is a bit like with emojis, I think, where you start out with just like the smiley face and the sad face. And before you know it, there's like an entire organization set up to define what this year's emoji should be. And we have multiple skin tones for emojis. We have multiple expressions of them, multiple genders of uh, emojis. And it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing. So, yeah, really interesting sort of area to look at this. UTF-8 is what we most currently use, uh, and that stands for... I saw there was like two definitions of this, but I've gone with Unicode transformation format. So this is often what we use in Python when we're trans transmitting and receiving characters. We'll have to make sure they're in UTF-8 format. And then right at the very top of the stack, we have um, the application itself. So think about a web browser like Chrome or Firefox or Brave or whatever you're using. Um, and this is where things like HTTP, you know, the hypertext um transfer protocol whatever it stands for uh, lives and things like the web servers as well so alum says unicorn <laughs> transformation format he had some other weird google it i've got my other little machine next to me here just uh i was going to do something on this to sort of show something today but in the end i couldn't get it working so i go for uh utf8 and just type that in there um it's got another definition of that so it was the U that was the bit that was like contentious. So I think it was either something or Unicode. Uni yeah, or universal coded character set transformation format. So yeah. So this OSI stack is used in many industries and you'll hear about like layer three switches and so on. So you think, well, what's my third layer there? We're talking about IP routing there. What's a layer four? That's to do with like uh, the actual packets of information. So firewalls might sit at the transport layer, perhaps maybe between that and the, the session and they can inspect packets and do stateful inspection of the packets and make sure that they're well formed. Because when we originally put the internet together and all these kind of devices, it was done kind of without a security in mind, security is kind of a, a, a bolt on afterwards. So that thing I said before about when I when I send you a message and you have to acknowledge that you've sent it back, what would happen if you just kept sending messages and didn't listen to the acknowledgements? Then the thing would just keep having to do acknowledgements back. And you can basically do denial of service attacks by doing things like that, by just continually either acknowledging something or sending very, very large data packets um, because the buffer has to receive these and then try and assemble what it is and if you keep seeing the massive ones it's just going to make that buffer overflow so there's all little hacks like that where people sort of cheated the system and then they had to put a lot more error checking in to make everything work and that slows things down a little bit so yes it's um, one of the things I think is quite useful to know uh, and understand how it works Right, so <laughs> this is what the show is about today and it's ridiculously simple so using few this is how you create an access point. You type in access points and then the name of the access point that you want to broadcast. We're going to do this in a second and we're going to show you what that looks like on a, on a mobile phone or a tablet. So that's how simple. Now, there's quite a bit that's going on behind the scenes there, but you don't need to worry about that. You basically just need to import few and make sure access point is um, imported as part of that. And then you can just do AP equals access point and then Wi-Fi in the woods, for example ridiculously simple so that's setting up the access point now remember we said we need a dns server as well so a few also makes it easy to do a dns server that's also one line of code now i've added a few extra lines of code just to sort of put this in context so just grayed out there you can see it says ip equals the access point 
interface config and then in brackets and then it's got that little um, square brackets with zero that means we actually get a few ip addresses back we get the the ip address of the machine we get the um, default gateway and we get i think some of the other um, bits as well like the mask perhaps we only need the very first one which is the ip address of the uh, the device itself i've also put in some logging there and dns.run catchall and then the IP address of the machine is a thing that sets our DNS service working. So it's as simple as doing that. So catch all catches all the requests from the user browser. Remember when I said, we're basically gonna take all the requests and just throw them away and give them the page that we want. And that's how it's captive. We're captive um, capturing them and what their requests are and ignoring them. Um, and we're just gonna define the code um, in this server.catchall function um, a bit further up. And that's what we're gonna look at in a second. And then we do server.run to run the code itself. So if you like what I do and you want to help me grow the channel even more, we're heading towards 10,000 users, users, subscribers. I would really like to get there sooner. Uh, I would rather get to that 100,000 sooner. <laughs> so I'm a tenth away there very soon. So if you want to help me along with that, make sure you give this um, a like. Drop me a comment. Let me know if the few is something that you're going to use. Have you, are you going to create your own access points? I'm going to create millions of these, I think. <laughs> Uh, and remember to hit the bell and subscribe to the channel as well. It really does help me out, cost you nothing. Uh, and if you're going to watch the content anyway, why would you not want to subscribe? Uh, I do go live every single Sunday religiously at 7 o'clock uh, GMT-ish. It's like it's GMT plus one currently. Um, that changes depending what time of year it is. So uh, I go live every Sunday. I'd love to catch you and uh, speak to you and meet you in the chat. Right, let's have a bit of a demo, shall we? Okay, let me head over. I'm just going to go back to me for a second and just bring up Thonny. Um, so there's a couple of ways we could do this actually. Um, I'm probably just going to talk you through the code is probably the easiest way. <laughs> Last week I wrote the code from scratch and if I miss one line out it can ruin the show. So I'm not going to do that this time. So what I will do though is I will get my, uh, my browser open like this. Let me just move this down. And let me just click on stop. And what we're going to do is we're just going to look through this code. So this is part of my Cyberdog code. This is what I'm building up um, and working towards. Um, and this is where we're going to create an access point. So let me just move this about a little bit more. There we go. Just so you can see all the bits and pieces that are going on. Right. That's not quite there, is it? There we go. You don't need to see that bottom bit. There we go. So the first thing we need to do is we need to install few. Now I showed you how to do that last week. You can basically use few, you can, uh, upip even. So if I go to, uh, let's have a look. I'll just basically want it to show the, the shell like so. But I also want to be able to, I want you to be able to see what I'm typing as well. So I just need to maneuver that about, about there. That'll do. Okay. So make sure we've got that plugged in. There we go, we've got a console. So if you've got a network connection, so if I connect to my network, for example, I think I've got my secret.py there. Yes, yeah, so if I just do import secret, in fact, if I do from secret import SSID, these are just two variables I've created and also password. And if I then do w um, import network, in fact, import network, and then I do um, import upip, and pip is the package manager for Python, upip is the MicroPython version of that as well. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect my network the hard way because you pip, a few makes this really easy to do once we've got this established. So I'm going to do um, wlan equals network dot wlan wireless LAN and then network dot static interface or station interface um, and then we do wlan dot uh, active true and then we do wlan oops let's wait for that to catch up wlan dot connect and then we have to pass in our ssid and our password now this is just to connect to our regular network and we'll do the ap thing in a second right and then we can then say is is it connected to our wireless LAN? So is connected um, like so. It is connected now because it just takes a minute or two. And then we can do things like get that IP address. If we do interface config 
and we just do brackets, we get all four bits back. So the first one is our IP address, the second one is our network mask, the third one is our default gateway, and the fourth one is something else I can't remember. <laughs> so if we want to get just the first element of that, we can just do the square brackets and zero, and we just get that thing back, which is our IP. So if I do I, oops, if I do IP equals, and then WLAN if dot if config, and then zero like so, then if I just print out what our IP address is, we get that nice IP address there. And then if we want to install few, we do upip. Now that we've got an internet connection, we can do this install and it's called micropython few like so. And then it's going to install the latest version of few onto, onto this device. So let's see what we're on 0.0.2. I know that there's a 0.0.3 out there, but this is fine for now. Um, in fact, I hope I've not just ruined my show by doing this, by by uh, running some code there. But that's how we install few. And then instead of using this hard way of connecting to the Internet, what we can actually do is a much simpler way. So we can basically just say um, connect to Wi-Fi and we'll do that in a second. Right. So I'm just going to move this down a bit further just so we can see the code. In fact, I'll move this bit higher up so we've got more real estate uh, like so. That's better. Right, let's talk through what's going on here. So I'm importing few.server and I'm importing the redirect from there. That's going to help us redirect any requests from the user's browser to whatever we want it to be. I'm going to import garbage collection. GC is the garbage collection in Python. This is something that happens behind the scenes, but we can tweak this uh, and we want it to be uh, quite efficient at garbage collection. And by efficient, I mean we want it to be able to make large areas of memory easily accessible. If it fragments them, um, it has to go hunting for bits and pieces. And if we do garbage collection, it basically crunches all that down. So there's like a large contiguous area of memory uh, and therefore it can quickly uh, in a single go grab some memory. Domain is just a variable that we're going to create for the address that appears on the captive portal. So instead of having like kevsrobot.com, we're going to have pico.wireless. That's what we're going to call our domain name. And then we're going to create some routes. So remember when I was talking about routing is part of our access point. And this is the same when we were doing stuff last week with uh, serving web pages. So this is a decorator, this at. Uh, and this is instead of just doing server to add root, we can just add this little decorator. And we pass it the root that we want the user to connect to, which is the, the root, which is the slash forward slash. And the two methods, again, this we covered this last week, get and post. Get is to uh, just get a web page and we don't send anything ourselves. We just say, get me that page. Whereas post is where we say, here's some form information, such as like a username and password. And then we get some information back. We're going to do both and we're going to handle both scenarios. Now, the reason we handle both is I'm going to have a form and this form is going to have um, one field on it. Initially, it's going to have a text field. So I want to be able to scroll text on my Cyberdog coat. Um, and I want to be able to put that text into the form and then press send and then that text will then start scrolling on the dog coat. So I have to post that to our web server. Um, so that's what that's about. Um, what else have we got on there? So if the request is a get request, so if we're just sending, just saying, give me the page, then we can basically just say, yep, yeah, render the index.html page. If we've, we're doing a post, if there's some data to be uh, captured there, then we can say text equals request.form.get text. So the form will have a field on it that's called uh, text, and we want to get the contents of that text. Uh, we've got some logging.debug messages here just to help show what's going on on the console a bit further down. Um, so that's that. Then we're going to render out the uh, the template, but we're also going to this time include the text. So there is within our index.html, there's some of those curly brackets that we looked at last week, and we can then basically insert a variable into our web page. So whatever is in that text that we captured from the previous form, it's going to echo back onto the page. Um, now we've got some other pieces here. So there's a wrong host redirect. So this is a new endpoint and it's just a get one. So it's just to redirect. Uh, and what we're sending out here is um, basically parts of a web page. So the body is this. This is just raw HTML. And this says refresh the content, but redirect them to this new URL, uh, which is HTTP Pico Wireless. 
um, and then the root of that. So that will then get rooted to this one here and therefore display this page. Now, if they've then, if they've actually got a completely different request, so say it's gone they, on their, their phone, they go to google.com, we want it to be able to, um, to reroute all those kind of wrong messages. So that's what this uh, these next ones are for. So they basically just take whatever we get and they redirect them um, to the correct location. So you can see there, catch all catches any request and it will say if request headers are host and they're not the domain name, if they're not pico.wireless, then redirect them to pico wireless, like so. Right, and then the very bottom bit, this is how we do an access point and a captive portal. It is as easy as this. So the access point equals access point Wi-Fi in the woods. Change that to be whatever you like, and that's what will appear. I'm going to do that in a second, and I'm going to show you how cool and easy this is. I then just capture the IP address using that thing I've just shown you before. Uh, and then we basically just say log that information to our log, so log.info. I'm using an F string here because I can then put that IP address in curly braces and it will then render that out as a whatever was in that variable. And then I'm using the uh, the new DNS service to uh, capture anything and we have to start it on our own IP address as well, whatever we've got. And then server.run and then we basically just say the website has started. So whatever we have in our index.html, let's have a quick peep at that. Um, so if I come down to here and just open that up. Um, so you've got all the usual kind of stuff. This is the interesting bit. So it's got a heading one. Let's make that heading one. And that says Cyberdog version one. And then we've got them curly braces with that text variable. So if there's anything in that, it'll display there. If it's empty, it'll just not display anything. And then we'll say choose an LED pattern. And this is where I'm going to put the buttons that you can choose. You know, do you want it to sort of flash red, green, yellow, do a cycle color, all that kind of stuff. We're going to have different options and buttons for that there. And then I've got this form and this form will post the contents of whatever is in this input, this text box. Uh, and the text box is called text and that gets sent back when we post the form. We're posting it to the, um, the forward slash. So when that gets received by a web server, it'll go, all right, this was a post request. Therefore, there's probably some um, data I need to look at in the request header. And we've got a button as well, which is submit. And then that's it. That's the page. So let me run this. Now, hopefully I've not ruined it by uh, just overwriting few with the previous version. But let's give this a go. Oh, I'll try to run a web page there. That's not very clever, is it? Let's run that again. Right, let's have a see. Uh, so the first thing it says is server name is not defined. So that's probably because I've just done what I've said. So what I need to do is just very quickly um, grab the right code and then upload that. So let me just do that a second. What I'm going to have to do is just find that. Um, I did download that previously. Why did I do that, Kevin? Stupid boy, right. Um, let me think where I actually stuck this. I think I put it under, well, let's just download it. Uh, so if I go over to, let me just go to me for a second. Uh, let me just open up. This is how I would go about getting the, the contents. It's on GitHub and it's under Pimeroni and it's under few. Right, so if we go over to here so I'm just going to grab the, the latest code. You can see look, John's been working on it two hours ago. This is how up to date it is. We're on version three. So let me go to the releases. Let me grab uh, the latest version. You can see there the assets. Uh, and we can basically just grab that source code. Download the zip file. Let's open up the zip file. And then let us open up this. And what we want to do is just grab the contents of this and copy that across to our uh, our Thony thing. So if I just, uh, let me just think about the best way to do this. If I drag few across to here, no, that's not going to work. Let's just right click copy. Let's find the library in here. So this is MicroPython and I'm actually, oh, that's why I'm in the wrong place there. So I need to be in Cyberdog. There we go. And then let's go into here on Cyberdog which will be there. And then let's just paste this in, paste item. So that should now appear in Thony in a second. I mean, these are tiny files. I don't know why it's taking so long on a, a Mac M1. This is insane. <laughs>
it's because there's lots of people watching right okay so that's there so there's few so if i now go in here and i just basically just copy across uh, upload to the right folder would help so go into lib into few right let's upload that into there okay basically i want to upload everything so let's upload the dns so upload okay upload now there is other methods of uploading files um there's something that's called micropython remote or mp remote and you can use that you have to install it first obviously but that means you can just use the command line to upload things it's probably a bit quicker than right clicking each individual file um but i've not got that installed on this computer just yet right there we go so that's the last one let's try our code again and fingers crossed we're all good okay so it's not happy with line 12 still i'm going to see what's going on there what have i messed about with uh, and why does it say line 12 in here so i'm just going to open that up a bit further i must have done something wrong on here i remember i was looking at the code previously um so now the other good thing is i i saved the code before i went live so jonathan says you're only supposed to, you've only imported server from few is that right ah okay so that's what's going on there uh where's all the rest of the stuff gone then so let's just do import few should that be uh good enough do we think uh yeah only ported redirect so if i import everything let's import logging i'm sure i have this running let's import um um i'm probably doing this wrong now so let's just do that from there and then from a few import logging templates and so on uh, what else do we need on there is that good enough let's give that a run um so it's still not happy with that so what am i doing wrong there name server isn't defined so let's do server let's try that access point and access point is is that also in here like i said i actually had this running before so i'm a bit confused why this decided not to work now and then dns there we go right okay we're up and running Right, so we can see that it says server started on 192.168.4.1. I think that's the convention, isn't it, for access points uh, with, with, with regard to MicroPython. And it says starting catch all DNS server on port 53 and starting the web server on port 80. And what we've decided to call our wireless, if we look in our code, is a Wi Fi in the woods. There we go. So if I go to my, my tablet, let's just grab my tablet here and let's see what access point we can uh, we can view on here so if i go to this overhead yet yeah, we can stick this tablet in the way and let me just zoom back a little bit first of all okay so if i just uh, zoom in as me and let's go to the access point piece so i'm currently connected to my wi-fi oops currently connected to my wi-fi and look what we have there we have wi-fi in the woods so if i press on that and I just come back to this web page and let's just refresh that in a second the captive portal should kick in once the uh, the access point uh, connects to the Wi-Fi there and we should also be able to see uh, okay so it's thrown an error and that's why it stopped working there so let's see what it says uh, and it's probably to do with um, the template thing I'm using so render template isn't defined and that's because I've not pulled that across so let's go back up to the top here and do render template like so let's just save that and run that again okay and we can go back on here let's go back to scroll down click on i'm just going to move my camera a bit higher right just so we can see the tablet a little bit easier right uh no t no module named uh few dot render template and that's because it's in the templates one isn't it john and so let me just go back down to there so if i go template is it templates or template templates let's try that 
I did have this working before. I don't know what I've done. I must have deleted um, something by accident. If I just go to the end there and add in from few input, I'm typing one handed here, import template, import render template, and it's from view.template. And let's try that. And then let's see if that's going to work. Okay, so let's try connecting to our Wi Fi hotspot. So if I do that, we've got Wi Fi in the woods. I press on that. Let's see what happens. There we go. Okay, the captive portal has worked. Okay, so here we go. We have Cyberdog version one, and that's in. Um, in that heading one style and it says there choose an LED pattern and enter the text to scroll right so last week we didn't have this working where you type in something and the the actual form gets processed let's type in hello world and if I press submit now watch the very top there because it should type in hello world there we go and you can see there that it says um, on the little log thing down here post template message and um, it's processed that look, posted message, hello world. So this is how I'm gonna get the text from my mobile phone connecting to the Wi-Fi in the woods or whatever the access point is called. Um, it's cool, let's try that. So this one says, uh, Pimroni is cool, let's submit that. And then you can see there, we have that message display in there. There we go, it's a bit easier to read now, like so submit that we get that sent back so there we go we're capturing and if, if I type in anything there because I'm in a captive portal I can't get out of here I'm, uh, I'm sort of trapped within within the uh, the captive portal as you can see there it says Wi-Fi in the woods captive portal and when I connect to this on um, my other computer you can see at the very bottom it actually says Pico Wi-Fi or Pico Wireless which is the name of the uh, uh, the Wi-Fi, the domain that we created earlier. So there's a little Pico that's doing all this uh, connectivity for us. And I'm really glad that that's finally working. A little bit of hacking there. Uh, thanks for, uh, for John for helping me out with that. Uh, yeah, so that's that's how we do it. It's, it's as easy as that. Right, let me get back to my keynote because there's a little bit I wanted to show you as well. So coming soon, CyberDog. <laughs> so I want to, like I said, build my I want to build a Wi-Fi controllable RGB LED code for my chihuahuas. I've got two chihuahuas, Archie Mini, and this is Archie here. And the code will use a Pico W in the access point mode uh, to enable the control of the lights using that, that beginning of the form that you've just seen there. The Pico will connect to the Plasma 2040. So I've got my, uh, my Plasma 2040, which is just here. Uh, and you can see that one just on the camera at the back flashing away there. That's the peak, the Plasma 2040 just there. We've also got the uh, Gallium battery and the uh, LiPo uh, Amigo Pro just there as well. That's providing power uh, and that'll be completely wireless. I'm not sure how long the uh, the RGB LEDs will last on that battery, but we're gonna find out. Uh, as long as I've not got them too bright for too long, it should be it should be cool. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I've got uh, on the on the saddle. The Pico will connect to the Plasma 2040 using that Pico to Pico communication that we covered two weeks ago. It's just UART using a little bit of a, um, a library that I created. I think it was called Easy Comms. Uh, and then all that sits inside this nice little saddle, which fits perfectly on the back of my little pooches. Works on both of them. Uh, it's really lightweight, the actual saddle. Even with all those electronics on, it's still really, really lightweight. The batteries weigh hardly anything, uh, but they're really robust because they've got that nice hard shell on them. And it's very lightweight, very safe, um, lighter than their regular harness, in fact, so very simple. You can see the RGB LED cable just dangling off there, and the idea is we're going to have all that underneath the raincoat and they're going to be like hot glued. I just have to commit to slicing up the RGB LED strips of which I've got quite a few on the desk at the moment. You can see how many RGB LED strips we've got an awful lot of them. Um, so I bought a few of these during the uh, the sale so that wasn't um, didn't hurt too badly there. So that's kind of what I'm shooting for and the, the last couple of videos I've kind of been building up to this so um, the next video hopefully should show a working model uh, of this. 
So if you want to help, um, if you're not, if not, if you want to help, but if you want to join uh, our Discord server and take that conversation to the next level, you can head over to action.smilesfan.com slash join dash discord, or you can go to Kev's, uh, kevsrobots.com slash discord as well, which is probably an easier link to it. I need to update this so it has that on it for next time. <laughs> Remind me about that one, Alex. Uh, if you want to follow me on social media, you can go to um, Instagram and I'm on uh, at Kev's, Kevin McAleer on there. Uh, and on Twitter, and I tweet a lot, I'm on uh, at Kev's Mac on Twitter as well. Um, and if you want to help out the show, there is a few different ways you can do that. And, and I really do need the help as well. So you can do a super thanks. Um, uh, and you can do that if you're watching back on replay. If you're watching live, you can do a super chat. Uh, and I think that comes through loud and clear if I've got all the right options enabled on here, which I have now. Um, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash Kevin McAleer and buy me a coffee. And a few people did, uh, have done that so far. They, they're always a nice surprise when I get those as well. And it does help pay for all the equipment um, and LED RGB strips as well. They're not cheap, are they? Uh, you can also join the YouTube membership and we've had a couple of people do that in the in the past month as well. So thank you so much to those people that have done that too. OK, I think that is everything for our show today. So we'll, we'll go over to the live chat um, and uh, continue our conversation there for people who are watching live. And this is the point in the video where I say if you're watching this on replay, this is the point in the video I'm going to have to wave you goodbye and say thank you for watching and I shall see you next time. <laughs>